So just a little background about me. So I did train in anesthesia um, over at Stanford, and I actually did two fellowships in palliative care over at Cedars, and then did another training in interventional pain management at UCLA. Um, and I currently work with oncologists over at UCLA dealing exclusively with cancer pain. Cancer pain is very individualized, and we can spend, I can spend an hour with each one of you talking about how to approach your cancer pain and the management for it. However, today we're really going to focus on more of the generalizations. So why, um, why cancer patients may experience pain, what are some of the causes, and then what is the most, um, what is the most used, used approach to um, treating cancer pain and we'll go over the World Health Organization's three-step analgesic ladder and then we'll talk about ways how you can take control um, and be an advocate for yourself and how you can talk to your healthcare provider team on how to best manage your pain. Um, so as you all know whether you have a cancer diagnosis or you're taking care of your loved one with cancer we know that a cancer diagnosis and especially one with very advanced disease can have um, immense consequences and cause a lot of distress into your life. Um, and this can include multiple domains in your personal and your social life. Um, and that a lot of patients are now faced with making decisions that they've never really thought that they had to make at this point in their life. They're thinking about um, the future of their loved ones and making decisions that have life and death implications while at the same time trying to navigate a very complicated healthcare system. Um, pain is just one component of cancer and it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have cancer you're going to have pain. However, when surveyed, a lot of patients actually say that pain is one of the most feared symptoms and a lot of patients worry about dying in pain um, and that it is a really critical and important component to make sure that it's covered during their cancer care treatment. Um, and every patient's pain will be a little bit different. So pain is a subjective experience um, and depending on your past medical conditions, your past history, all of each person will um, experience pain a little differently. So even if I have patient A and patient B at the same stage of pancreatic cancer, they could be on completely different medications. Um, and so it does take time for you to talk to your healthcare team about how to best approach your team, um, uh, best approach your pain. So here are, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what causes cancer pain. So in the first category, um, pain from diagnostic tests. So this could be getting a biopsy, a spinal tap, a bone marrow tap. All of these tests may cause pain, and patients sometimes, they're so fearful of the pain, they don't even want to go through the tests. But I want to assure you that this kind of pain can be treated, and that the, met, the information that your doctors receive from this kind of test is so valuable and will help them direct their treatment that you shouldn't shy away from getting diagnostic tests that are really important for, for your healthcare team to try to tailor your individualized cancer care treatment. The second category is pain from the tumor. This is what most people think about when they think about cancer pain. So the tumor is compressing on tissue, on muscle, on bone. Um, you have metastatic disease. This is what we call, uh, a lot of people think about when they think about cancer pain, and it is, for the most part, the majority of patients I treat. In the third category, we have pain from treatment. So a lot of patients undergoing chemotherapy will have symptoms like nausea, they'll have symptoms diarrhea, like diarrhea, um, but also they may have pain. Um, and this is something that can ca be caused from chemotherapy, from immunotherapy, from radiation. If any of you or your loved ones have gone through radiation, you may know that sometimes the pain gets a little worse before it gets better. Um, and also surgery, so resection of a tumor um, post-surgical pain is a real issue that a lot of patients are very fearful about but can be treated. And the fourth category that I put in a smaller font but is also really relevant is that sometimes patients with cancer have pain that's completely unrelated to their underlying malignancy. They can have arthritis in their, in their joints, they have low back pain, they can have migraines. All of the things that would affect your peers with non-cancer can 
also manifest in yourself while you're undergoing cancer treatments and having other um, cancer-directed therapies done. <clears throat> I wanted to take a minute and talk about a few um, definitions of terms that you might hear in cancer literature or when you see your doctors. When we talk about pain, we separate into two big categories, nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Nociceptive pain is pain that, um, let's say you bump your elbow into something or you hit your knee and you feel pain because it's sending, wherever you hit yourself, it's sending, um, your pain receptors have been activated and is sending signals up to your brain and saying you are experiencing pain. That is nociceptive pain that is injury to body tissues. Then you have neuropathic pain, and we hear a lot about this with diabetic neuropathy, um, but also chemotherapy-induced neuro um, neuropathy, and that's usually when you have a lesion in the central or peripheral nervous system, and it's called nerve pain, and we'll go into that a little bit more. For the most part, a lot of my patients actually have pain um, that's mixed. So they have pain that falls into the nociceptive category, and they have pain that's also neuropathic in origin. Nociceptive pain can further be divided into somatic pain and visceral pain. So somatic pain, you see this lady holding her knee, usually it's well localized, you hit yourself or you burn yourself on your hand, um, you can point to where your pain is with one finger. It's usually sharp um, and uh, it, you can tell exactly where it is. Visceral pain on the other hand, you have visceral nociceptor, so it's still a type of nociceptive pain. But patients who have intra-abdominal malignancies, if they have pancreatic cancer, um, G-junction cancer, if they have intra-abdominal metastases, so if you have liver meds, sometimes that pain, you can't quite point to it with one finger. You just feel that you have abdominal pain and it's very diffuse and it's aching and it's cramping. It's still nociceptive pain, but we call it visceral pain. Neuropathic pain, um, CIPN is chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuro neurotoxicity. And we hear this term a lot because with certain chemotherapy agents, so taxanes, platinum agents, vinca alkaloids, those medications can cause neuropathy in your hands and feet. And sometimes patients will say they're their hands and feet feel numb, they have pins and needles, and it can be very um, difficult to treat and have a very big impact on patients' quality of life, especially if the pain is affecting their dominant hand, they can't hold things, they can't cook, they can't write. Um, some patients that I have are artists and they can no longer do the things that they enjoy because of neuropathy. For the most part, neuropathic pain actually responds really poorly to opioid medications. So these are the typical medications that we think of when we are thinking about Norco, um, Vicodin, morphine. Neuropathic pain actually doesn't respond very well to those types of medications. The best type of medications to treat neuropathic pain is actually neuropathic agents, including gabapentin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, Amitriptyline, um, Venlafaxine, those type of medications. Patients will often describe neuropathic pain as feeling pins and needles, stabbing, burning, shooting pain. Um, and they're often on multiple different medications to try to make, get that pain under control. Another um, few definitions that you might hear your doctor saying um, is acute pain, chronic pain, or breakthrough pain. And I wanted to take just a few minutes to go through each of these types. So when I think about acute pain, um, patients usually will say that they have pain that only lasts for a short amount of time. So that short amount of time is very variable. It can last for minutes, days, weeks, months, but usually not more than a few months. Um, when I think about acute pain, I think about if patients had a surgery um, and their pain is primarily post-surgical. So they are, their acute pain should actually get better day by day, day the further they're, uh, they're recovering from surgery. Um, 
On the other hand, chronic pain is pain that continues three to six months after the initial insult. And in this case, a lot of patients may be started on an extended release medications like MS Contin or OxyContin in order to provide some baseline pain relief that is ongoing at their baseline level. Then you have breakthrough pain. Breakthrough pain is acute, can be really severe, can last for minutes, hours, um, and it's usually on top of chronic pain. And it might be related to a certain movement or activity, or it might just come on very suddenly without any inciting factors at all. Um, sometimes for patients with intra-abdominal malignancies, it might be triggered by after they eat. Regardless, it's pain that doesn't last for a very long time. And in this case, we usually use short-acting medications like Norco or Dilaudid or Oxycodone, something short-acting on top of their long-acting medication to try to just um, manage that breakthrough pain. So, how do you treat cancer pain? The World Health Organization came out with this three-step analgesic ladder years ago. And for the most part, it works for the vast, vast majority of patients. So at the most basic level, we have non-opioid plus or minus adjuvant. What does all that mean? So non-opioid medication is what I think about over-the-counter Tylenol and anti-inflammatories, which include ibuprofen, naproxen, um, or prescription strength, meloxicam or Mobic. These medications provide great um, pain relief, and sometimes patients may need additional adjuvants. And in the adjuvant category, we think about neuropathic medications like gabapentin, maybe some steroids to provide additional benefit. Um, from my perspective, I feel very strongly that pain is very complex and responds to multiple different receptors. So Tylenol works very different than ibuprofen. And a lot of patients will often come to me and say, oh, I'm already taking Tylenol, so I'm not taking ibuprofen. For me, I actually recommend patients to be on both and scheduled because now you're attacking pain from multiple different receptors, providing much better pain relief than when you're just using one class of medication. If your pain keeps going up, and despite being on scheduled Tylenol and scheduled ibuprofen, then the next step would be to start um, a gentle opioid. So a gentle opioid includes Tylenol with codeine, um, or codeine, and usually some Norco as needed, or low-dose Percocet. <clears throat> In this case, you should still continue your non-opioids and adjuvants. However, if you are taking Norco, Percocet, or Vicodin, or Tylenol number threes, those all have Tylenol content in it. And then in that case, I work with the patient to try to make sure that they don't exceed the daily maximum dose of Tylenol, which is 3,000 milligrams per day. Um, if patients have liver metastases, I always look to make sure that their liver function is okay. You can still take Tylenol even if your liver function is a little abnormal. Um, and then in terms of anti-inflammatories, I always check with patients to make sure that their kidney function is okay um, and that they're not on any blood thinners. So some cancer patients may have had a blood clot and they're on blood thinners, they're on Coumadin or Eliquis. Um, in that case, I don't recommend them being on anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen or naproxen just because it can interact with their blood thinning medication. At the third level, if your pain is still severe despite being on an opioid as needed, your Tylenol, your ibuprofen, and all of these adjuvants, then we think about adding a higher, stronger dose um, opioid medication. And in this case, this is when we talk about extended release, OxyContin, MSContin. Your doctors and your healthcare team might consider starting you on a fentanyl patch. They might talk about methadone. Methadone, I know um, a lot of patients have heard the word before because it traditionally has been used to help with um, drug abuse and coming off of opioid abuse um, or heroin abuse. However, in the pain literature, especially cancer literature, um, methadone is an excellent pain medication which has both opioid qualities and neuropathic qualities. So patients, like we talked about, 
a lot of my cancer patients have mixed pain. They have nociceptive and neuropathic pain. And so methadone actually ends up being a very good medication for these patients. So I would say um, that 90% of patients with the World Health Organization's three-step analgesic ladder, actually their pain is managed and it's fine. But for a very small percentage of patients, they still have very severe pain or they can't tolerate the effects, the side effects of the opioids. So the constipation, the drowsiness, the nausea, they just can't get past that and they can't take those medications and they still have a lot of pain. So in the past few years, um, different organizations, professional organizations have thought about maybe that the World Health Organization's three-step ladder should be actually modified to a four-step ladder. And so now you have this Step four, which includes a little bit more targeted techniques, but also a little bit more invasive that carry higher risks. These include nerve blocks, epidurals, a PCA pump or an intrathecal pump, neurolytic therapy, and then spinal cord stimulators. So these are normally done by interventional pain specialists such as myself. GI specialists can do celiac plexus blocks, um, and other blocks for intra-abdominal malignancies, and then interventional radiologists can also do these procedures. I can spend a whole talk talking about each one of these specific um, modalities, but I just want you to know that if you can't tolerate oral medications or you have side effects, or if you've tried all of them and you're still having pain, that there are other options that you can talk to your provider about. And if your oncologist doesn't know, that's okay. You just ask them for a referral to a pain specialist or an interventional radiologist or someone else who is familiar. They don't need to know which of these specific um, modalities would be suited for you. They just have to know who to refer you to and who you can get more information from. What are some reasons that some patients aren't receiving the pain management um, <coughs> and are not getting the adequate treatment that they need? One of the reasons is that not all doctors have the same training in pain management. Depending where they train for their fellowship, depending on their comfort level, um, some doctors are actually a little bit hesitant to talk about pain, or they want to spend most of your visit talking about your chemo treatment um, or other areas of your cancer care. Because there's, as you know, there's so much um, to talk about in a short visit. And some of them just might want to spend time, divulge time to other areas, or they might feel uncomfortable. Another reason um, is that sometimes I have had patients tell me that they're actually um, uncomfortable talking to their doctors about their pain. They're worried that if their pain gets worse, that maybe they've somehow let their doctor down because the chemotherapy that they um, prescribed wasn't working as they had hoped, um, or that they're worried that the cancer is getting worse and they don't want to bring it up. Regardless of the issue, if you don't bring it up, then they won't know. So I really advocate for you guys to at least speak up, let them know that you have pain, um, and if they don't feel comfortable managing it, always advocate for yourself and ask for a referral to a specialist. A lot of my patients in the recent, um, in the recent setting of a lot of media attention on the opioid ep epidemic have, have told me that they are afraid of taking pain medications because of addiction. Has anyone heard of is the opioid epidemic and has felt that way? So I have to say that there are only a few indications truly for opioid therapy and cancer pain is one of them. And <clears throat> I wanna spend just a minute talking about the difference between tolerance, dependence, and addiction. Tolerance is when you need more of a medication over time to get the same benefit and same relief that you did when you first started the medication. That amount of time is really variable from person to person, and it, it's really hard to predict. So let's say I used to take five of Oxy to help treat this pain, and it would make my pain go from a 10 out of 10 to, to a two out of 10, and I was really happy with that. But now, I take a five of oxy and it only brings it down to an eight. Um, they did scans and my cancer hasn't progressed at all. It could be that I'm developing tolerance to the medication. 
Um, dependence is when you are taking a medication and introducing it to your body so regularly that if you stop it suddenly, your body would have withdrawal symptoms. So withdrawal symptoms from opioids feels kind of like you have the flu. So you have muscle aches, you have your, a lot of congestion, you just feel overall icky. Um, with both tolerance and dependence, there are inherent properties of opioids <coughs> that can't be avoided. But I don't want the fear of these two things to, for patients to not take pain medications when they need them. Because my biggest priority is to make sure that your pain is controlled and that you're not suffering. Um, addiction, on the other hand, is an actual medical diagnosis, a chronic psychiatric diagnosis, which means that you know that these meds are causing negative consequences onto your health and your social life. You're taking them not for pain, but you're using them recreationally, um, but yet you still continue to use them. And it affects a very, very, very tiny fraction of patients who are actually using the medications as prescribed. Um, one of the things that I tell my patients, because of the fear of tolerance and dependence, you can't really avoid it. One of the things I tell my patients is, let's say we get your pain under control. Let's say your cancer is actually responding to the chemotherapy or immunotherapy, the tumor is shrinking. If we ever see a window where we can titrate down your drugs, um, your med pain medications, then we should take it. So I always work with my patients to try to taper down medications when their pain um, is at a minimum and it gives their opioid receptors um, a rest and it kind of resets their system. So in case we need some of these stronger pain medications again, their body is ready to accept it and they're ready to, um, it responds kind of like when we initially started the medication again. Um, and then of course the fourth category is fear of side effects. Constipation, nausea, drowsiness, um, itchiness, Constipation being one of the most feared complications with opioid therapy. I have patients saying, I'd rather be in pain than go through the constipation that I had when I, had, um, when I took opioids or when I took morphine after my surgery. Um, I want to assure you that <coughs> we can treat through the constipation. We can actually treat through all of these side effects. For the most part, patients will develop tolerance just like they do to the medications. They develop tolerance to the side effects except for constipation. So constipation never goes away, but there are many medications out there to treat the constipation. Another issue that I've heard a lot of patients say is that they have constipation, they take a bunch of laxatives, and then they get diarrhea, so then they stop the, they stop the laxatives, and then they have constipation again, and they're constantly chasing their tail, and it becomes this vicious cycle, so they're just like, forget it, I don't wanna take pain medications anymore. It's too painful to take pain medications because of the side effects. Um, I always tell patients, if you are gonna be on opioids regularly, it's best, best to find some sort of bowel regimen, a stool softener such as Senna. I always recommend Senna, one tab twice a day to start, and then Miralax as needed. And to stay on this regimen every single day so that you develop a regular bowel routine. Um, and so that you don't have a vicious cycle. And if you've been on these medications that are usually over the counter and you're still having constipation, then we talk about um, medications that are specifically for opioid-induced constipation. And there's a medication called Novantic or Naloxagol, um, which can help with opioid-induced constipation, but insurance usually wants to see you try the over-the-counter stuff before we do that. Um, the other medication I want to, the other medication I want to mention real quickly is Docusate or Colace. So when you go over to your pharmacy and your CVS and you see a whole aisle of laxatives and stool softeners, Colace is a stool softener, so it's an emollient. It doesn't necessarily push your stool forward, which means it doesn't really do anything for opioid-induced constipation. Um, the reason why people get constipated with opioids is because it slows your gut down. So you usually want a motility agent, which is like Senecot or Miralax or Lactulose that helps move things along. So how can you be your greatest advocate um, and get your providers, your doctors, your oncologists, 
whoever's taking care of you on the same page. The best way to do that is I actually encourage all of my patients to keep a pain diary. What should actually go in this pain diary? Um, all doctors will love it if you come with these key components in your pain diary. So using a numeric rating score, zero to 10, and I'm sure you've all heard this whenever you go for your chemo treatments, how bad is your pain today? Zero being no pain at all, 10 being the worst pain of your life. It's always good for us to get a sense of where your pain is, um, zero to 10. How would you describe your pain? Is it achy, dull, throbbing, sharp, stabbing? Using descriptive adjectives is actually really helpful in helping doctors trying to formulate how to address your pain because it helps us categorize, is this more nociceptive? Is it more neuropathic? Is it mixed? What kind of medications are gonna be best to help treat your pain? And then where your pain is located, um, as well as aggravating and alleviating factors. And by that, I mean what makes your pain worse? Aggravating factors. And what makes your pain better? Alleviating factors and what pain measures um, you have used and the efficacy of that. So by that, I mean, what pain medication did you use? And it doesn't have to be medication. It could be um, heat or ice or anything that you tried for your pain and how much it actually reduced your pain. I feel very strongly that if you're on some medication and it's not helping you, there's no reason to continue it. A lot of my cancer patients, before their cancer diagnosis, were actually really healthy and were not on medications at all, or they were just on a blood pressure medication. And all of a sudden, they have 12 medications that they're taking every day. Um, and their pill burden has become extremely high, and it's very overwhelming for them and their loved ones. Um, and so I really feel strongly that if there is something in your pill box that's not helping you, then we shouldn't continue it. But I won't be able to know that unless you show me that you it's not helping you. And the best way to do that is keeping a pain diary. I want to introduce one last concept, and it's the concept of total pain. So the concept of total pain actually comes out of the um, palliative and hospice literature. For the most part, we have been talking about physiologic and physical pain. If we can identify the source of pain, if it's from your tumor, um, if it's from surgery, then we can use these medications that we talked about to address your pain. However, like all of you guys know, a cancer diagnosis can have many um, implications and affect your life in multiple different areas. And sometimes a patient's manifestation of pain isn't just physiologic. And it's hard to tease out because all of these different domains um, intersect with one another. But they have real um, real contributions to a person's perception of pain and manifestation of pain. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little time talking about each of the domains. So social pain. When you have a cancer diagnosis, sometimes you lose your sense of identity, your sense of self, self your social status. You might not be working anymore. You might be depending on other people when you used to be completely functional and independent. You might be worried about your family, the future of your family, or you might have financial concerns. All of these things weighing on the back of your mind, even though it's people don't think of it as pain, it may manifest as pain. Psychological pain. With cancer diagnosis, a lot of people have a lot of anxiety, depression. Um, they may think about their prior experiences with se severe and serious illness in both themselves or their loved ones. Um, and all of that can also manifest as pain. And then we have the spiritual component. So anger at fate, being angry with God, um, fear of the unknown, having a loss of their faith, and all of this can also manifest as pain. So <clears throat> the most typical example I think of this as is, let's say a patient comes to me with pain and we go we follow the World Health Organization's three-step analgesic ladder. And we're now at step three. Now we're thinking about this modified ladder. We're at step four and doing nerve blocks. We're doing an intrathecal pump. We're doing more invasive things to treat the pain. The pain never gets better. And then at that point, we have to start thinking about maybe there's actually other components that are contributing to the patient's pain. And we spend a little bit more time talking about all of these other issues that could be manifesting itself as pain. 
working together um, with your healthcare team to help address your cancer pain. So the most important thing is if you don't discuss your pain, no one's gonna know that you're in pain. So please just bring up the issue with your oncologist, with your nurse practitioner, with whoever is taking care of you to let them know that you are having these issues. Set a goal and monitor your progress. Short-term goals, see how you're doing, and then it's very important to actually keep in close communication with your prescribing um, physician or nurse practitioner and be flex about, flexible about any modifications that they're recommending for your pain. If your pain does not improve or it gets worse, then this is when you really um, should ask them for a referral to a specialist, either to a palliative care doctor or to a pain specialist. Um, and I promise you, they're not going to um, they're not going to object. As you all know, cancer care takes a team effort, and there's so much that oncologists want to cover in their short time with you. With pain specialists and palliative care specialists, our whole reason that we have with patients is purely to talk about your pain and your symptoms. So we can spend the entire visit kind of delving into your symptoms, delving into what worked and hasn't worked. Um, and so I promise you, they're not going to be bad if you want to get an additional person involved in your care. Um, and here are just some of the key takeaways that I hope you guys all um, at least remember, is that your pain can be managed and that pain control is part of your cancer therapy. You should talk openly, share openly with all of your providers. Um, the best way to control pain is to stop it from starting or keep it from getting worse. Keep a pain diary with your pain scores zero to 10, how bad it is, um, what makes it better, what makes it worse, and um, share it with your doctor. The other thing that I wanna mention, <laughs> take your medications as prescribed. Don't try to save it for later. I, I always tell my patients, I wanna figure out what works for you. Um, so we can always modify it if it doesn't work, but I don't, I don't want you to hold back from treating your pain. And remember, those side effects, constipation, nausea, we can all treat through those side effects. So don't be afraid to take pain medications. Um, and that everyone, the most important thing to remember is everyone's pain management plan is gonna look a little different. Um, just because you have the same underlying diagnosis, just because you're at the same stage of cancer, doesn't mean that you're gonna have the same pain management plan. Um, and that is pretty much it. Um, so if there are any general questions, I'm happy to take them. Or if you have any individual questions about your own case, um, I'm happy to stick around afterwards and answer those as well. Yes? I am going to pose the question that I brought in when I came to the program. Uh -huh. You gave an answer within your speech, but is cancer always a pain for the experience? So not necessarily. Yes, yes, of course. Is cancer always Yes. So I'll repeat your question. Thank you for your question. The question was, is cancer always a painful experience? And that's not necessarily true. We actually have, um, we always, we actually have some patients that don't have any pain with their cancer. Um, for the most part, I would say about 60% of patients probably experience some pain with their cancer. And again, it depends on the actual diagnosis of what type of cancer you have. Um, but it, it isn't always, a, having a cancer diagnosis does not equal pain. <coughs> any other questions I can, general questions? Yes. Um, the great German doctor, Max Gerson, found that giving coffee enemas every four hours significantly reduced cancer pain in patients and they no longer needed their payments. Anyway, I was wondering, should that be under the supervision of the doctor? I think it should. So um, I have heard a few patients actually come up to me also saying that they've been doing coffee enemas regularly. I think that it is, I don't have a strong feeling about that, but I think that you should still let your doctor know that you are doing this, um, just so that they can keep an eye on any electrolyte imbalance. Um, so fleets enemas that you can get 
from this drugstore can actually cause electrolyte imbalances. Coffee enemas, maybe not so much, but at the same time, you should still just loop your provider in and let them know that this is part of the therapy that you're doing at home so that they know um, if anything is not looking right with your labs or anything else that they're not scratching in their heads wondering if there's something they're missing from their end. Yes? Um, have there been any studies regarding, say, cannabis cream with uh, nerve pain or anything like that? So CBD, cannabis, THD, it's all, it's a very hot topic right now. Um, there's not a lot of studies on it because it's at the FDA level, cannabis is still considered a schedule one medication. In California, we've been using it medi medically for years and years and years, and now it's recreationally available in multiple states. I will say that anecdotally, a lot of patients receive great benefit from it, and I always encourage patients, as long as they're not getting side effects, and as long as it's providing them their benefit, I don't have any problem with it, unfortunately. I just don't know what specific products to recommend, and because it's not FDA approved, a lot of the products that patients are using are kind of word of mouth from other people that they've had good experiences with. Um, you always just have to be careful that whatever the amount or whatever content the product that you're using says it has in the bottle or the cream, you don't know if that's true or not because it's not regulated. Um, so that's just one thing to be careful. But if you find a great product, tell me about it so I can tell my patients about it. Yes? Do you think the FDA will eventually regulate cannabis? I think they're getting there. I think there is a movement right now where the FDA is swinging the other way and are um, funding more studies with cannabis, also with other psychotropic um, medications um, for depression. Um, but I think that it's going to be a long road. I think it's going to move there, though. Yes? Um, did I understand you to say that um, ibuprofen and um, Tylenol can be taken concurrently? Yes. Um, and uh, I understand that, I mean, I was taking ibuprofen, then I was switched to Tylenol threes, but the ibuprofen I hear is not good for your liver. Yes, so that, I hear this a lot from patients, so and I'm not right. sure where it comes from. So ibuprofen is a anti-inflammatory, an NSAID. It actually affects the kidney more than the liver. Oh, well. You can absolutely take <laughs> ibuprofen and Tylenol together, and they work synergistically, and so actually what I recommend patients doing um, is taking ibuprofen 400 or 600 at a time, three times a day with meals, so you always take ibuprofen or anti-inflammatories with food. Tylenol you can take without food. Neither of these medications should be sedating. You can actually take them together. There's no reason why you can't take them together. So, uh -huh. as need or depends on your pain. So if you have pain that's constantly bothering you all day long, I say just schedule it. Just do it, and I say give it a good two-week trial. Take ibuprofen and Tylenol both three times a day, and it's not going to have any long-term effects. But not alternate them? Because when I did it, they just alternated. So I actually have my patients take them together. Like what are the limits, daily limits? So ibuprofen, maximum dose, usually um, prescription strength ibuprofen is like 800 milligrams, usually three times a day. Over the counter, I think the tabs come in 200, so some patients will take two or three at a time, and that's fine. I usually say no more than three times a day. And then Tylenol, the maximum is 3,000 milligrams, which means the extra strength, which comes in 500 milligram capsules or tablets, that would be six a day, yeah. So you just have to be careful if you're taking Norco or Vicodin or Percocet that you're not also overdoing the Tylenol. But if you're just using over-the-counter medications, taking two tabs of the extra strength Tylenol three times a day, along with two or three of ibuprofen three times a day, take it concurrently, take it with each other, there's really nothing wrong with that. And patients may actually feel a lot better taking those medications together. So if you have them together and you have breakthrough pain, then you have nothing to take in between. True. Whereas I think that's yeah, if you alternate. That way, mm -hmm. if you have the breakthrough, you have yeah. something that you can use in between. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's no right way to come up with um, pain is, is like an art. 
So yeah, <laughs> there's many different ways to do it, and there's no one right way, and a lot of time it's trial and error before you find the right way. Yeah. I, I find the Tylenol threes taken as needed effective. Yeah, and that could so be. The yeah, it's probably <laughs> the coating. Yeah. yeah, and with anything with opioids, with coating like Tylenol number threes, I would take it as needed. I would not typically schedule coding. <laughs> Are there any other general questions? <laughs> yes. Can you t um, describe the difference between a palliative care referral and a pain referral mm -hmm. and when either of them is appropriate So, having trained in both, um, I, and every institution differs. So palliative care, the misconception is that a lot of people think that palliative care equals hospice. And so people are very scared by the word palliative. However, palliative care should actually start right when you get diagnosed. It has nothing to do with the amount of time or your prognosis. And a lot of palliative care special <coughs> specialists can work with your oncologist and walk with you and um, focus on symptoms. Palliative care is also specially trained in having difficult discussions if you're talking about um, goals of care, end of life, those kind of things. All of those practitioners are skilled in having those difficult conversations, but they don't ne necessarily need to talk about that when you are just focusing on symptoms. Some institutions, um, palliative care is reserved for patients with prognosis, that are less than like a year or two, and that's really just variable. But for the most part, in general, palliative care as a specialty would like to get involved early on and doesn't have to have a prognosis less than six months, which is what hospice requires. So hospice is um, a, di a prognosis of six months or less if the disease were to take its natural trajectory. So if you're no longer receiving system systemic chemo, it, would a doctor be surprised if you died in less than six months? And if the answer is no, then you would qualify for hospice, which is different than palliative care. Pain specialists, and not all institutions have pain specialists that specialize in cancer care. Pain specialists, for the most part, um, are um, trained to do pain for just normal back pain for patients without cancer, um, but also with cancer, and that can be at any time. The main difference is palliative care specialists, for the most part, can't do nerve blocks, can't do interventions, and mostly can focus on, they're really good at symptoms, managing difficult, difficult conversations, uncomfortable topics, um, titrating medications and symptoms, but they can't do interventions, whereas pain specialists can do the nerve blocks, uh, the ablations, um, intrathecal pumps, and those kinds of things. Oh, ablation is just usually killing off a, a nerve bundle that's causing you pain. Um, and it's really dependent on what kind of cancer, whether that's an indication for it or not. Um, yes? What's the law for the use of marijuana products and growing in California? I don't, I don't know. What's the legality? The legality, so it is. Um, Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Plants at home, can you read the oh, you know? <laughs> you know, I actually. So the question was what's the legality of marijuana at home? In California. In California. <laughs> yes. I have to be honest, I'm not really sure of the specific rules in terms of growing your own plants. I know that it's okay to use recreationally, med medically. Um, but in terms of growing your own plants, I don't know, unless any of <laughs> Do you know the answer? I actually don't think you can. Years. Seven yes, plants? Yeah. Okay, you can, have, you can grow seven plants. <laughs> seven plants. What about other products like oils? You can have those. People make their own, and that's okay. Um, people actually make their own oils um, if they get marijuana or they grow their own marijuana um, <laughs> with their seven plants. <laughs> um, but yes, it's perfectly legal in California 
to have those products, to use the products, both recreationally and for medical reasons. Yes. Sorry, one follow-up question on the um, when you were talking about the ibuprofen and Tylenol. It just is what you said um, appropriate even if there's a heart condition that a patient has. No. So the other main issue, um, the big issue is that NSAIDs wouldn't be appropriate. So Tylenol is usually okay, um, except in patients with very, very severe liver disease. NSAIDs, if they're on blood thinners, if they have kidney conditions, or they have very severe coronary artery issues, a lot of their cardiologists prefer them to be on very minimal NSAIDs. NSAIDs are the ibuprofen. Yes, the ibuprofen, the Aleve, Mobic, aspirin, Celebrex. Aspirin isn't actually an NSAID, but it kind of it's a blood thinner, um, kind of falls into that category. Um, usually cardiologists don't love NSAIDs, so that's the other one. When yes. you said about the, 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 for the pain, what do they call it, the whole? Uh, the hospice. The hospice. Is that at home? Mm -hmm. So that's the other big, um, I think a lot of people don't spend a lot of time talking about hospice until they are at that stage. And so it's actually a really good, I'm glad you asked that question. So the question was, is hospice at home or is it a location? So hospice is actually a philosophy of care. And that care, for the most part, is actually delivered in the home setting. And a lot of patients at the end of their life, they actually prefer to be at home. They're surrounded in a familiar setting, they're able to sleep in their own bed or they're sleeping with their dogs or things that are familiar to them. Hospice is a service that usually sends nurses, caregivers, not 24 hours, but people to check up on patients like a couple times a week and then there's an overseeing physician that also looks at your case. And then the cases are discussed every couple weeks um, to see if there's any adjustments. Hospice can also be done in a facility like a nursing home and in rare cases it can actually be done in a hospital setting and that's what we call GIP or inpatient hospice and what that there's certain criteria that patients have to meet but usually it's that their pain or their symptoms are so severe that they require to be in a hospital setting where they have around-the-clock nursing care um, so that in order to control their symptoms. But for the most part, hospice is actually done at home for the mass ma vast majority of patients. And that's what patients prefer. Yeah. Um, many years ago on the TV news, I saw a lady who was a cancer patient and she said that Laetrile helped her with cancer pain. And my question is, if Laetrile is not a cure for cancer, can it at least alleviate pain? I, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to repeat your question, but I actually am not familiar with Latril. So the question was, does Latril help or cure cancer or at least help with no, the pain? No, they say it doesn't, but uh, does it help the pain at least that much? Can you explain what it is? I'm actually not familiar. Latril. Does any It's an extract of almond fix. Oh. oh really? So I actually am not familiar with that at all, so I'm sorry I can't answer that question. You're too young. You haven't heard of that. <laughs> Any other general questions? <laughs> it's like with Dr. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming and spending your lunch with me.